Historically, law and sexual identity definition, expression, and recognition have been closely intertwined. Immigration policy has served as a basis for the exclusion and delineation of what was previously considered deviant as well as acceptable sexualities, respectively, throughout much of the U.S. history. It is through trying to identify sexual deviance the law came to define, create, and regulate sexual norms, identities, and behaviors. In 1891, for example, the Immigration Act was brought under federal control and defined exclusionary criteria which marked moral turpitude as a category unworthy of legal entry. Though this category of differentiation was never explicitly defined, it came to be understood as encompassing sexual deviancy. Since the late 19th century, the homo-hetero-binary -hetero structured citizenship in such areas as the military, welfare, and immigration sectors, defining the proper citizen as heterosexual. Other government policies, such as Don't Ask, Don't Tell, as well as key court cases such as Boward v. Hardwick, introduced the status conduct dis distinction to criminalize the act of homosexual sodomy. Welcome to another episode of Religion and Society, a channel dedicated to investigating religious thought, history, and influence classically and in more modern times with in-depth research into academic publications and opinions in the fields of theology, philosophy of religion, and religious law. Given the name change of the channel, I will also be diving into topics surrounding social issues and contemporary law with some sprinkles of economics and psychology. If these topics interest you, be sure to subscribe and never miss out on a new, interesting point of interest of mine. Without further ado, let's dive in and explore the topic of LGBT asylum seekers in the 20th and 21st century, the challenges they face, and the history of this evolving form of immigration law in Western countries. Continuing into the 21st century, law still plays a role in not only how we understand sexual identity, but how this definition evolves and is theorized. Modern queer asylum law works to consolidate sexual identities while simultaneously broadening the possibilities for wider recognition of marginalized queer identities. This is achieved by petitioners having to prove which social category they fall into, requiring both the identification of the petitioner and the subsequent classification of the immigration officials. This, in effect, allows for the codification of specific sexual identities in asylum law while rendering apparent sexual subjectivities visible to the state. In addition, the flexibility of the social categories, as determined by petitioner's subjectivity and state determination, allows for petitioners to stake out new claims based on their unique sexuality. The introduction of sexuality as a social category worthy of asylum was a relatively recent development which occurred in the late 20th century. The initial 1951 United Nations Refugee Convention established five categories of asylum seekers alone, including race, religion, nat nationality, political opinion, and membership in a particular social group, where initially U.S. asylum seekers had to prove on a case-by-case -case basis that sexual identity belonged to the category of particular social group lifted, listed in the convention. It was only after the landmark case of Tabulas Alfonso, a Cuban gay man in 1990, that the then Attorney General Janet Reno declared the decision to serve as a president for future cases in 1994. So how does the process work? Asylum seekers must prove two things. Um, his or her sexual identity as the basis for the membership in a particular social group and either past persecution or well-founded fear of persecution on the basis of that particular identity. In terms of proving one's sexual identity, a same-sex relationship would be considered ideal, though given their circumstances of danger of such a relationship, this can also be proven with testimony from family or friends, or evidence of activity in queer activism or social groups. Given that asylum seekers may not be out in their respective countries due to the fear of persecution, this can prove difficult for this particular social group. Unfortunately, though, the law does not allow for the petitioner's testimony alone. Most judges need some form of corroboration. When it comes to persecution, both past persecution and well-founded fear of future persecution are acceptable and defined as sustained or systemic violation of basic human rights demonstrated by a failure of state protection. The persecution can be emotional, psychological, and or physical. 
Fear of future persecution can be determined on the basis of testimony as well as the country's history of human rights violations outlined by human rights groups, which are normally sought to be backed by the U.S. State Department. If it hasn't already been made clear, LGBT asylum seekers can face various barriers to entry when it comes to immigration laws. Um, as we will cover in the next section, we're going to be discussing immigration laws in the UK, as well as how that relates to the detention centers, which are filling up. As much as the process of LGBT asylum can help to create more fluid forms of sexual identity juxtaposed to the more fixed determination within the West's general understanding of sexual identity, migrants of this social category still face a number of barriers to successful entry to host countries, such as the UK. Detention centers in the UK are among the largest networks in all of Europe. Immigration detention is defined as the deprivation of liberty on immigration-related grounds and is the temporary home for asylum seekers who have been detained due to immigration-related issues. In the UK, detention does not have a specified limit of time, making it unique amongst other regions in Europe as well. Additionally, in the UK, detention, detention lacks automatic judicial oversight in terms of how this affects detainees. This essentially means that immigration detainees do not have the certainty of a prison sentence with a determined period of detention, nor the well-developed checks and balances that guard against the arbitrary imposition of power in the criminal justice system. Detainees also deal with physical and verbal abuse from staff, wrongful detention, as well as propensities towards self-harm and suicide. As mentioned earlier, LGBT asylum seekers must prove their sexuality in order to gain asylum in their desired country, which can often result in a negative assessment of the perceived credibility of asylum applicants, and as a result, a growing number of asylum seekers within this particular category face detention or deportation on the basis of disbelief as it relates to their claims. Western states rely on regimes of sexuality that only acknowledge certain forms of being that must fit into predetermined identities, such as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender identities, who are typically out and proud. This approach fails, as it hinders asylum seekers who do not fit into this mold, in effect ignoring the complexity of sexual and gender self-identification experienced by many migrants and asylum seekers originating from the global south. This comes into play as members of the social group, in response to the persecution they have experienced or fear, would limit their disclosure of these very same identities from which they seek to enter their host country. This non-disclosure then becomes a strategized means of survival that is used by host countries to limit the very aim it serves, survival. Also, in addition, given the abuse and persecution, LGBT asylum seekers often develop a deep-seated homophobia related to feelings of shame, which may serve to further limit the expression of their sexual identity within the judicial arena. Despite these realities, research conducted by Milbank and Berg in 2009 observes that refugee decision makers in both Australia and the UK have been slow to fully absorb and apply the insight that gay people are secretive about their sexual and relation sexuality and relationships as a result of oppressive social forces rather than by choice. In order to support their claims of asylum, LGBT asylum seekers must bolster their claims with evidence which can range from reports, documents, photographs, emails, letters, and if possible, even witness statements. One detained LGBT asylum seeker, Rami, from Zimbabwe, explained, Before I ended up in detention, I didn't feel the need to go outside and shout, Yes, I'm a lesbian. Now it's like everything I do, I have to prove something. If I don't put pictures of myself or my new haircut on my Facebook, they'll be saying I'm not open enough. It's not about who you are. It really isn't. It's never been about who you are. You just, you know, it's just about who you say you are and how much you can prove that you are who you say you are. It's about how much of a lesbian are you? Do you go to gay clubs? Do you hang around with other lesbians? How many lesbians can write a letter for you to say, yes, I know her, she's a lesbian. And of those lesbians, how many of those lesbians have been accepted by the home office or are British? So how does the future for LGBT asylum seeker community look? 
A recent paper published in 2002 by the Williams Institute at UCLA, UCLA School of Law highlights limited research in this area as a function of the lack of information pertaining to the number of identifiable LGBT asylum seekers globally. To this effect, among researchers, community members, academics, and leaders, there was broad consensus regarding the need for more systematic collection of quantitative data with measures of sexual orientation, gender identity, and variation in sex characteristics. Within the discussion, things such as quantitative data was pinpointed as useful to present clear and concise arguments to governments and other stakeholders about demographics of challenges uniquely facing LGBTQ migrants because it allows stakeholders to develop targeted interventions and to better advocate for specific law and policy changes. In terms of the persecution in the country of origin, they also highlighted the need for utilizing and bolstering research conducted by researchers within the home country, as opposed to the current methodology of research into harassment and difficult living conditions for the social group conducted by the Global North. This geographic diversity in research will enable the contextualization of the abuse that migrants experience in their country of origin, as well as highlight the nuances within cultural displays of discrimination and harassment, which may not be existent within the home country's legal system per se, but significantly threatening enough to dra dra dramatically influence the quality of life and life expectancy for this community. Another area of research concerns not only information on actors in direct contact contacts with the LGBT asylum-seeking community within the host country, but also research surrounding the judges and judicial decision-making to better understand the nature of rulings by immigration judges or how judges may apply refugee law on the basis of preconceptions or stereotypes regarding sexual and gender minorities. This is because these stereotypes can impact future migrants, such as the likelihood of the success in immigration processes. One major barrier here is the lack of government research, governmental research, for example, conducted in the U.S., lack of government publicly accessible documentation on regarding LGBT immigration cases, seriously impedes research into ameliorating this area of immigration. The full paper is quite lengthy and highlights a number of different opportunities and pain points as it relates to this area of research. I would highly suggest it for further reading in this regard. The existence of such a meeting with key proponents of these integral changes impacting the lives of such a vulnerable group make for a hopeful future surrounding the case of LGBT migrants, and I look forward to policy changes and more opportunities for the betterment of this section of society on a global scale.